Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. If you are new to the channel and as we are going along you start liking what you are hearing, please, we would love to have you as part of the family. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all, that way you'll be reminded of every time I happen to upload a video. Also, if you are interested in becoming a subscriber, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And afterwards, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So, I was 14 years old at the time. It was a Saturday afternoon. I was in a bus to come back home. I spent the morning running with friends in a park. So I was in the bus listening to music and looking outside through the window when I just checked the inside of the bus to see how many people stopped and I had left. As I scanned the bus, I made eye contact with a guy, maybe 23 to 25 years of age. I immediately looked back out of the window again and I just felt him staring at me. Every time I checked, he was looking at me. I was feeling very uncomfortable. It was like that for around 30 minutes. The bus finally arrived at my stop and prayed with all of my heart that he doesn't go down now. As the bus stopped, I saw him get up like 20 seconds after me, so I started walking faster, but he followed me and started talking to me. Him. Hi, how are you? You're beautiful. Me. Walking faster. Uh, thanks. How old are you? You're really pretty. Um, I'm 14. As he tried to talk to me, we walked by a group of people who stopped you to talk about whatever they promote or defend. A woman came to talk to me and started to explain to me her thing, so the guy backed up a little. After 30 seconds, he tried to talk to me again, and I just told him, I'm already talking to someone. So he backed up again, but waited for me. At this point, the girl asked me if I knew this guy. I was shaking and said no, and that he has been following me since I had been on the bus. She called one of her colleagues, and her colleagues, bless her, started screaming and shaming him for harassing a 14-year-old girl. As she yelled at him, I thanked the other girl and started running to my house. I ran for like 20 minutes. I had tears. And when I finally arrived at my apartment, I closed the door behind me. I was shaking and crying, but I was very glad those girls were there and that I was finally safe. So, to the fucking creep that was following a teenage girl, let's not ever meet again. I'm not a good writer, so I apologize in advance. To better paint this picture, here is a description of myself at the time of this incident. Three years ago, by the way. I'm a 5'5", 26-year-old woman, medium-length bleach blonde hair, curvy, 175 pounds, wearing black high-waisted tights and a pink crop top. Three years ago, I was walking home late at night from my friend's house. It was dark, and at the time, I lived in a rough part of a large city. I had many sketchy situations that I had gotten myself out of, so I guess I felt some sort of invincible, like nothing truly scary could happen to me. When I walked home, I always stayed very alert and aware of my surroundings for my own safety, just in case. About halfway home, and roughly ten minutes to my apartment, I noticed a van started tailing me. I was used to this since in my city it's very common for a young woman in a rough area to get propositioned for sex. 
It's embarrassing how desensitized to this I was. I did my usual and crossed the road so that I would be walking beside the traffic, heading in the other direction. I wasn't scared, I was just annoyed. The van then turned down the side street, then back onto the road that I was on and pulled up to me. At this point, I still wasn't scared. Again, this has happened so many times that it never mattered if I was wearing something that showed more skin or if I was wearing a winter coat, zipped from just below the chin all the way down to my ankles. That area is notorious for that type of activity. I decided to be firm and told the person sternly, I'm not interested. I noticed there were two men in the van. They looked almost identical and may have been twins or brothers. Both men had a very, very dark complexion, dark eyes and short, dark hair. The van didn't move. I was super annoyed and crossed the road again to get away. At this point, I figured this would be enough for them to stop following me. Well, they didn't. They kept circling back every time I crossed the road. I've never had to put that much effort into getting a horny pervert to leave me alone. So, this is when I started feeling unsafe. They zipped by me at the speed the traffic was flowing in, and I yelled for them to fuck off. I thought it finally worked. It had been three minutes and I hadn't seen the van, so I thought I was in the clear. Just in case, I pulled my phone out and was getting ready to call my sister that I live with. Just then, the van pulled up to me very quickly, and before I could even blink, one of the men jumped out of the van, opened the back door, and approached me quickly in an aggressive manner, as if he was going to scoop me up and throw me into the vehicle. The traffic in that area is very inconsistent. It was dead, and I imagine that is what they were waiting for. Just as the man was about to place his hands on me, I tilted my phone and said, You're being filmed in my live video chat. I gave my friend your license plate number, and the police have been notified. I was so scared, but I didn't let that show. I stayed as calm as I could. The man paused like he was considering if I was bluffing or telling the truth. So I tilted the phone more, as if to give the fake audience a better look at him. He then jumped into the van and they sped off. I have never been the same since that night. I'm afraid of walking alone now, even in the daytime. Stay safe out there. Two creeps in a van? Let's never meet again. I hope karma finds you both very soon. So I've been living in Paris for the past eight months and have felt relatively comfortable with my surroundings. I was coming home from a club on the first train that goes to my town. This is at around 5.30 a.m. Note, I was quite drunk and tired and just wanted to sleep, and I was wearing clothes for going out. There was this guy on the platform who tried to talk to me. I walk over trying to reach the next train car, over but failed. There were two open seats left, so I sit in one of them. He decides to sit in the one across from me. So he starts telling me, I really want to marry you. I don't want to fuck you or anything. I just want to be your one and only. Please, will you do the pleasure in becoming my wife? As he is saying this, he is caressing my thigh. I am genuinely uncomfortable and try to sink down in my chair. I'm just like, no, I'm not interested. I have a boyfriend, which is the truth. So he retorts, if you had one, he would be here with you taking you home. My boyfriend lives five hours away, close to the border between France and Germany and Switzerland. So he could not be there. I explain that to him and he says that not a good boyfriend to leave me here. He then says that he is a nice guy and has money and then he'll take care of me. I told him I'm really not interested. Then I get to my stop and he follows me out after I beg for him to go to his place. 
He continues talking to me, and I start shivering because I didn't bring a jacket with me. He sees this and forcibly puts his jacket on me. He says that I'm not feeling well and that he will walk me home. I beg him not to. He tries to talk to other people to get him on his side. We reach this one lady who saw my discomfort on the train. We explain both of our sides to her for about two hours. I kid you not. She finally says, you're not her boyfriend. You can't walk her home. I will. I was so thankful for her. We left and we had to take her bus to work. I thought I was safe, but sadly no. So I start walking to my apartment. I live about 10 minutes away from the station. I was about halfway there when I hear a whistle. I turn back and lo and behold, it's the creep. He runs up to me and continues to say the same shit and begs for my number. He does this all while he's caressing my face. I slap his hand and tell him, if he doesn't stop, I will hurt him. He continues so. I threaten to call the police. Only then does he scamper off. I came home at around 8.30, 9 o'clock and cried my eyes out. Creepy sudden marriage proposal, dude. Let's not ever meet again. This happened when I worked in a corporate office around the year 2000. The land around the building I was employed in was being developed. That meant lots of male construction workers. The area being actively worked on was sectioned off by a chain link fence. Of course, the opening was facing the keycard pass revoking doors I used multiple times a day. This was a posh desk job. To work in exercise, I used to park in the far end of the lot, so I had to walk. I worked on the third floor and always took the steps instead of the elevator. There were security cameras everywhere in that parking lot. My company employed a team of security personnel to monitor things. They regularly roved around the parking lot to make sure that everything was secure. I started having random construction workers waiting for me at my car daily to ask me out. I was married and let each one knew I was not interested. I didn't think to alert security about this. I thought it was harmless and random. I decided to begin keeping my gun in my glove box just in case. I also made sure I paid attention to my surroundings. This one particular day I worked later than usual. I was saddled with an issue that required my immediate attention. My schedule ordinarily did not vary day by day. At the end of this particular day, I was running 30 minutes behind, so I ran down the steps and started quickly walking towards my car. Out of the corner of my eyes, I saw a van speeding towards me. It stopped right beside me, so I took a few steps back onto a curb, not taking my eyes off of it. The driver rode down the window to talk to me. I noticed there were three other guys than Van. I said, What do you want? The driver goes on to explain to me that he's the crane operator for the construction site. He went on to tell me how he'd watched me with binoculars for the past few months. He even admitted to radioing down to the other guys as I moved about during the day. So... He was the cause of all the guys at my car. He had my schedule memorized. I'm standing there mortified, thinking, this isn't good. I had a feeling they were going to try and grab me. As he kept talking, he began opening his door. When his left leg touched the ground, I ran forward and kicked his door as hard as I could onto his leg. Then I ran as fast as I could towards my car. As the driver got over the pain from me kicking his van door onto his leg, I heard him behind me. I always have my car key or remote in my hand when I'm headed to my car. I made it. Then, I got my gun out of my glove box and pointed it at the driver. He sped off. I was scared to death, shaking for the whole drive home. 
As soon as I got home, I called the security desk at my employer's office. I told them about what happened, so they reviewed the security footage. It was such a close call, they instructed me to park in a reserved parking spot that had a camera fixed on it. They had me escorted into and out of the building by a security staff member daily. I was advised that if I deviated from my schedule anyway, they would have to call in the police unless I notified them about the change. Security went to the police and presented the security tape. They also went to the construction manager. The crane operator was fired and his parole was revoked for his violation. I was told he had done time for violent sexual assaults, the R word, in which I can't see on YouTube, and sodomy. I couldn't identify the other three guys that were with him. He refused to tell who they were. So I looked over my shoulder for quite a while. Seriously. How many freakish events can happen to one person? I learned to never ask this again. Knock on wood. I hope I'm never faced with another situation. Best wishes. Have I ever been stalked by a girl? Well, my answer is going to be a long one. Please bear with me. Yes, I have been stalked by a girl. She was in my class in engineering. She was a typical first bencher who always studied hard, spoke less, introvert, liked by all lecturers and students. Everyone had a high regard of her. Whereas I was a last bencher, quite naughty in class, extrovert and friendly with people. Yet I was very good at studies and very much focused about my goals in life. I had made up my mind to become an IAS, Indian Administrative Service, officer when I was at school and made constant job efforts, like reading the Hindu newspaper, making notes of NCERT textbooks, studying prescribed books, etc., to achieve my goal right from class 11. Once in class, during our first year engineering, our lecturer asked each of us to tell about our goals. Since I was quite vocal and took pride in becoming a civil servant, I spoke at length about my goal of becoming an IAS officer. Unfortunately for me, she too had the same goal. I had never spoken to her in person. I just knew that she was a typical first bencher who studied well. In third year of my engineering, some of my friends and I started a club for science enthusiasts in college, and were looking for members who were interested in joining the club. Then, a mutual friend, who was a fellow founder of the club, spoke to me about getting her into this club. Without giving much thought about it, I agreed since she was good at studies. This led to me getting to know her. Though I had never noticed her much, being in the same club gave me a chance to interact and I got to know that she was an IAS aspirant too. I used to give her tips on how to study for the same. That was the limit of my interaction with her. I thought of her as a very dedicated student and a good friend. That's about it. Never did I try to go an extra mile with her. I had my own last benchers group with whom I used to hang out, always, both guys and girls. Never told her or involved her with any of my personal stuff or things that would make her feel like I was interested in her, like chatting for long hours or going to the movies or typical dating stuff. My interaction with her was limited to discussion about our club, IAS things, and friendly conversation. It was our last day at college. She came near my room and gifted me with an edited, swapped my face with movie stars who had played roles of an IAS officer in the movie. Photo frame. I thought it was a great gift, though badly edited, and thanked her for it, and went back to my room and took my afternoon nap. When I woke up, I was in for some shock. I had received... 60-plus WhatsApp messages from her number. 
She had narrated how she had a crush on me from the initial days of college and how her liking for me increased when she got to know about our common goals. Everything was described in intricate details, antidotes about various incidents. I thought it was great of her to remember things in detail, but I made it very clear that I have no such interest in her and she was just a good friend. In fact, I thought of her as a sister. She always gave that sisterly vibe, like never bunking class, always sitting in first bench listening to the lecture intently. I did not tell her then that I thought of her as a sister because I thought it would be rude on my part to say that to someone who had just confessed her big crush. Moreover, I liked some other girl. I didn't think it was necessary for her to know that. I just had to convey that I was not interested in her, and I did. Then started stalking days. Within a week after I completed my engineering, I had to join my work in a different city. This made things worse. She used to ping me every now and then in WhatsApp, inquiring me about every single detail, like if I had my lunch or not. She told me that she doesn't feel like eating until, and unless, she knew that I already had my food. Though it might look nice on the outset, I felt it was very immature and started ignoring her texts. Is it only me or do others too feel suffocated when someone who you are not intimate with starts texting you so much? Her messages increased exponentially with every passing day. Though I told her very clearly I was not interested in her, she kept on messaging me saying that she too was doing that as a friend. But this incessant texting made me irritated. I had to concentrate both on my work and my dream of becoming an IAS officer. In addition to this, her constant pestering made me feel like it's a nuisance. Failing to make her understand that I don't like such constant messaging, I blocked her on WhatsApp, thinking that getting blocked will give her a clear signal of me not liking her and will make her stop messaging me. Meanwhile, I hadn't told any of my friends about her pestering me. I thought it would spoil her good girl image. But things took an ugly turn from there. She started obsessing about me and started mailing me on my email ID since I had her blocked on WhatsApp. Some people from her hostel, people whom I don't even know, also started emailing me wondering why I was doing this to her. Those emails used to be very lengthy, describing how I'm hurting her by ignoring her. I took pity and unblocked her on WhatsApp, but this time I made it very clear that I not only don't have any interest in her, but I always thought of her as a sister. Believe me, Indian guys don't just call a random girl as a sister. They do mean it. She agreed and started adding the suffix brother to every sentences in her text. This continued for one week, and then again, things started becoming the same. She not only told that she cannot think of me as her brother, she also proposed me for marriage and would send my father to my house to convince my parents to agree once I had achieved my goals. That's it, I thought. Things had gone too far. I had to put an end to this. I told her sternly that things are taking a wrong turn here. I don't want you messaging me and disturbing me and wanted to be left alone. So I blocked her again. This did not stop her though. This is where it started feeling like an emotional roller coaster, emotional harassment to me. She started calling me from different numbers and texting me from those numbers. Until now, I have blocked more than 20 different numbers of hers. She had texted me from her parents' numbers, her friends' numbers, and had brought many SIM cards too. Some of her friends, whom I don't know personally, texted me that I was being very cruel to her and should unblock her and listen to her once. Once I unblock her, I used to get the same old, do you really like me? I'll send my parents to your house to talk about marriage. No matter how much I told her that, I don't like these things. And it didn't change. 
All of this was excruciatingly painful for me and emotional. I thought I had enough of this and started informing some of our mutual friends about this. They initially denied it, telling that a good girl of her stature could never do such a thing. I had to show them the screenshots of proof. Only then did they start believing. They too started convincing her to leave me alone, but it was all in vain. I unblocked her several times again, convinced by her friends that she had moved on and would not stalk me anymore. But in the end, it would again come down to, do you really not like me? I had had enough of it. I would give her chances to reform her ways, then end up getting abused. How stone-hearted I am, how insensible I am, etc., etc. This constant mental abuse had a toll on me. Some of the effects were, number one, I started to fear girls, especially introverted ones. One cannot say what are they thinking inside their mind. Though I know all girls are not the same, I find it difficult to talk to a girl openly now. Number two, my studies started deteriorating. I gave IAS prelims exam once and failed. I could not come to terms with it for a while. I had worked so hard for this from class 11. Number three, I was in acute depression, constant abuse by WhatsApp texts, calls, SMS, emails, and lobbying through mutual friends had made me depressed. Number four, with depression came insomnia. I found it hard to sleep at night. I was always thinking of all these things she had told me while abusing me. Were they all true? There was a constant inner fight within me. If what I was doing was right or not, should I give up resisting her and accept which was opposing to my inner feelings? Number five, my self-confidence hit a great, great low. An IAS aspirant is supposed to be very confident, but in my case, things were taking exact opposite turns. I lost faith in myself. Number six, I started speaking to psychiatrists online through various apps, asking to help me with this emotional abuse. I was scared to go meet them directly because going to a psychiatrist is still a stigma in India. Number seven, when her abuse and harassment reached new levels, I even thought of going to the police to complain along with some of our mutual friends with all of the evidence. I researched online. A man cannot complain against a woman for stalking him. No section in Indian penal code makes this a crime, but vice versa is a punishable crime. This made me still helpless. Number eight, I started staying aloof. I no longer derived pleasures in doing things which I used to enjoy earlier. I started avoiding social gatherings. I started becoming an introvert. I kept in touch with only a bunch of my close friends. Number nine, I started fearing calls from unknown numbers, thinking that it would be her calling from some unknown number just to irritate me again. I still don't pick up calls from unknown numbers if the number of the caller is not displayed in true caller. Number 10. Meanwhile, I left my job after a year and three months to prepare for the IAS exam exclusively. My failure in my first attempt had disappointed my parents and my brother. I had no courage to tell my parents about this incident. I feared they would feel that their obedient son failed to achieve his dreams for some small problem caused by a stupid girl. Believe me, it was not so small of a problem for me. Number 11. When I shared this entire story with some of my close friends, they started saying that I was lucky that a girl herself was talking to me. When the normalcy is for a guy to stalk a girl, they made fun of me. They all took it as a joke without realizing how disturbingly true it was for me mentally and emotionally. There were some positives that I can take out of this entire episode which lasted for more than two years. Number one, I started to have great respect for girls who get stalked by guys. Now I know what exactly they go through. 
a little stalking might be okay with anyone, but when it reaches a level that one starts feeling abused, it is not okay at all. Number two, I always thought of myself as not so of a emotional being. This whole episode brought out a different side of me. I don't know who exactly I am and what exactly do I need from life. And more clearly, what or whom I don't need. Number three, since I had been a victim of depression for almost two years, I now can empathize with my friends and family who are suffering from depression. I make a special effort to talk with my friends who are going through depression. I support them, saying it's just like some other disease and one should go talk to a doctor. I make sure that they never ever feel lonely. Number four, I realize that not all silent and decent looking girls are actually good, and not all outgoing and extrovert guys are bad. I don't judge people quickly now. Number five, Recently, I shared this whole episode with my brother, who asked me, what is it with me and not picking calls from unknown numbers? He was very supportive and told me that I did a good thing by sharing this episode with him and some of my friends. He told me that it's good, and I kept some friends informed about these developments. Number six, there is a dire need for making some sort of Indian law gender neutral. I have nothing against feminists, or I am not a misogynist. I only believe laws should protect everyone equally. When laws are gender neutral, only then can they bring harmony in society. I still get messages, even after blocking, SMS will be received, and I get a notification named message from block contact from her that she has moved on and that I should forgive her and should be normal to her again. I have forgiven her, but I don't think I'll make the same mistake of trusting her ever again and begin being friends again. I just don't need it. I still get abusive messages that I am hurting and stuff. I just tell her to fuck off. Yes, I used it, which translates to get lost, only after two and a half years of her drama. And to leave me alone, I just don't care. I felt it was necessary for me to share this because stalking is not okay at all, be it a girl or a guy who undergoes it. When crossed a limit, it has the capacity to disrupt your life. I request you all not to stalk anyone ever. P.S. I'm giving my second attempt of IAS this June. Please wish me the best of luck. And please keep me in your prayers. Warning, long story. Yes, my ex became my stalker for three years. It was hell, and I do mean pure hell. Stalker lawyers were not yet on the books, so I had to deal with him in the best way I could. Thank God I was a state employee. That meant the state police could get involved, and boy, did they. They were almost like my bodyguards. They were terrific. They would walk me to and from my car. They would come into the office to check on me at least once a day. They were great guys, so protective. But they couldn't follow me home. I was alone with two babies at home. This all started when my ex filed for a divorce. We were separated, and I no longer cared about the marriage. It was dysfunctional and abusive. Twenty-five years wasted except for my children. However, he thought surely I would contest the divorce. I didn't. I just signed the papers and sent them back to the court. I wanted no child support and no alimony. I had a good job and didn't really need his money. I just wanted him gone. When he found out I did not contest the divorce, all hell broke loose. His plan to scare me into submission did not work. He was outdone this time, and he was fit to be tied. He would call me at least 50 times a day with threats of violence, even at work. He called my boss and lied. He tried to get me fired. He called my coworkers and harassed them. I was humiliated. 
He came to my job and was caught letting the air out of my tires. He called my family. He alienated my children. He had my check garnished by telling the county that he was the custodial parent without checking with me or checking their school records. They just started deducting half of my paycheck for child support. I had to take a day off work and travel 60 miles to straighten out the mess he had made. He finally called my pastor to cry on his shoulder. He was looking for allies. He couldn't find any. Finally, he broke into my house one night and tortured me for six hours. My whole face was swollen black and blue. After he beat me, he fell asleep trying to choke me to death. He was that drunk. After he fell asleep, I slowly slipped out of bed and called the police. He was awakened with mace in his face. Boy, did he scream. They took pictures of my face and hauled him off to jail because by that time, I had a restraining order. So, he went to jail that night, but he bonded out a few days later. They called me to let me know he was out. I was so nervous because he left his car at my house, which meant he had to come back to get it. I stayed up all night waiting for him to come and get his car. I didn't know what he would do next. He finally came walking up at about 1.30 a.m. I never saw him move so fast. He wanted to get out of there fast. I was relieved, but that was just the beginning. The calls and threats kept coming even though I had a restraining order, so I began taping them. Next, he started driving by my house. Once, I went to stay with my mom because I was just so frightened and exhausted. I was just about to close her front door when I saw his van drive by. I became hysterical. I called 911. I told them he's stalking me at my mom's. They said they were on the way, but he left. I went to stay with a friend that night. I didn't feel safe even at my mom's. I didn't want him to see my car there and break in the house and hurt my mom. She's a frail widow. I didn't sleep at all that night. I had two babies with me. It was miserable. I felt so bad for them. One night, I went to an outdoor concert with a friend. It was family concert, so I had the kids with me. I was just getting relaxed when I looked up and saw his van coming around the corner. I was terrified. I thought, my kids, where's my kids? There were a bunch of kids playing in the grass nearby. I saw my little one, but my daughter was missing. She was eight years old. I started calling her. By this time, he was out of his van and calling my kids to get in his car, drunk again. My daughter came running when she heard his voice. I said, let's go. But once he shouted for them to get into his car, they obeyed. That's what they were used to. I couldn't blame them. I didn't have a cell phone then. I ran to the nearest phone booth and called 911. I told them he kidnapped my kids. I was screaming into the phone. Everybody at the concert looked up. I didn't care. I had to get my kids. Meanwhile, he pulls off with my kids, driving drunk. I raced to my mom's to see if he dropped them there. They weren't there. I called the cops again. They had Bolo out for his van. I sat up all night. I couldn't sleep. I was so scared for my babies. He was out of his mind and unpredictable. I prayed all night. The next morning was Saturday. My heroes, the state police, called me to tell me his van was now at his house. They were waiting all night to see if he would come home, and he finally did, with the kids. They looked fine. They were going to get my kids, and I needed to be there. My heart was racing. I jumped in the car and drove the 60 miles in half the normal time. When I got there, they had his house surrounded. They said they knew he was there because he answered the phone. They had a bullhorn. They were commanding him to send the children out first. They asked me if he had a gun. I wasn't sure. He never had one when we lived together. He wouldn't respond. We sat there about an hour. They kept calling his phone, but he would not answer. Finally, 
He opened the door and said the kids weren't there. They told him to come out with his hands up. He did. They handcuffed him and asked if anybody was in the house. He said no. They asked where the children. He said he did not know. They went in. The kids were not there. They kept asking where the kids were. We saw you go in with them. He finally asked them where they were. And he said they were with his brother in another city 50 miles away. They asked, how did you get them to their uncle's house? He flatly said he came to pick them up. They asked him when. He said an hour ago. I was undone. I thought, how did this happen right under our nose? Then I remembered the back door leads to a major street. He let his brother take them out of the back door while he was waiting in front. They took him to jail again. I had to travel another 50 miles to get my kids. I asked his brother to give him a few choice words. No answer. I thought they probably haven't arrived yet. That's another long story for another day. At any rate, I didn't see my kids till late that night. I was so relieved and grateful to God that they were not hurt or dead. So were they. On the way home, they said he was taking them to Arkansas but had no money for gas. I thought, thank you, Jesus. There's a lot more, but this is getting too lengthy. In the end, he finally got arrested and charged with terrorist threatening the tapes that I had made. Assault with a deadly weapon. He tried to ram my car into heavy traffic. And vandalism, my car tire. He was facing 15 years in prison. He made a plea and got probation. He never bothered me again. Thank you to the Lord above. This was back in 2013 when I was living in New York as a 23-year-old. I was living with my best friend from college on the west side near Times Square in K-Town. I was going through some rough times back then as I was unemployed at the time. I had a lot of time so I would go on walks by myself to clear my head from time to time. One night I was feeling especially depressed so I decided to walk to K-Town to grab a drink by myself. I'm Korean, by the way. I walked into a Korean bar and I got some weird looks from the waiter as I asked for a table by myself. After ordering a couple of soju bottles, I was feeling pretty drunk, so I decided to walk back home. However, as I was exiting out of the bar, this Korean guy followed me. He looked very normal, just like a nice Korean guy. He told me that he saw me drinking at the bar by myself and that he would love to walk me home to make sure I got home safe. I politely declined. After all, my apartment was pretty close, but he insisted and he looked so harmless that I decided to take him up on his offer. We walked like 10 minutes, I do believe, and it was quite pleasant. We were both a little drunk, but I remember talking about all sorts of things nothing personal. When we finally arrived at my apartment, I thanked him and wished him farewell. Now, my apartment was a five-story walk up and there was a main door where we needed a key to open it to get into the building. There was no doorman. I didn't think much of it and inserted the key to open the door and went in. The door takes a while to close shut and it was my mistake for not checking before I went up the stairs. While I was approaching the second floor, I heard someone grab the door from closing, and I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I literally got goosebumps all over my body, and I felt like I was in danger. As I started to pick up the pace, I heard the footsteps going faster up the stairs. I lived on the fifth floor and started to run up, clutching my keys in my hand. The guy started to run up the stairs as well and I can literally hear him getting closer and closer to me. This all happened in a matter of a couple of seconds, but it felt so long. 
I finally got to my floor, and as I tried to open the door, I looked back and literally saw the guy's head on the staircase. I rushed to open the door, and I managed to close the door right on his face. My heart was beating so fast, and I didn't know what to do at that point. It was already 3 a.m., and my roommate was asleep. Luckily, he didn't knock or anything, so I decided to just go to my room and hope that he's gone home. Around 7 a.m., my roommate woke me up. She said that there's a man standing in front of our apartment door. My heart sank and I explained the whole situation to her. She and I went to the door and screamed that we were going to call the police if he doesn't go home. I looked at the peephole and he told me that he will only go home if I gave him my number. We then called the police and saw him being escorted out. My roommate had to go to work, so she left the apartment and called me a few minutes later. She told me that she saw the guy speaking to the police downstairs. Apparently, he tried to lie to the officers that I'm his girlfriend and that he got into a fight. My roommate went up to them and explained to the officers that I do not have a boyfriend and that she doesn't know him at all. The police let him off with a warning. About two hours later, I hear a buzz from the main door downstairs. Maybe it's the police? Surely, it can't be him again. I answered the intercom, and I was shook. It was him again. Just give me your number and I'll go away, he said. I warned him that I'm going to call the police again if he doesn't leave. A couple of minutes later, I heard ferocious knocks on my door. He must have gotten in when someone was entering the building. I was so scared at that point, so I immediately called the police. Unfortunately, the guy ran away before the police got there. The worst part about this experience was that my roommate and I were so scared to leave and come back to our apartment. I would have anxiety every time I came home, worried that I might see him in front of our apartment door. For about a week, the police escorted us when we felt scared. God bless them. I never saw him again, but it was one of those scariest moments of my life situations. So, to the creepy stalker dude, I hope we never run into each other ever again. I worked third shift at a convenience store, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. At that time, I was a 20-year-old single female. I worked the cash register while my coworker, who also happens to be a female, worked in the food service area. One night, this gentleman came in and made multiple comments to me about how beautiful I looked, how he would love to have a young woman like me, how I would make a perfect wife for someone. Overall, creepy comments that shouldn't be made to someone you just met who is trying to do their job and make a living. I tried to play nice with the guy and he finally left, disappointed that I hadn't returned his advances. I mentioned it to the other girl while I was working with after he left and she rolled her eyes and told me that I needed to get over it. She also told me that I should be grateful that I was getting attention. He began to come in every night after that. If I was working, he was following me around the store, asking me very personal and inappropriate questions. If I wasn't working, he would ask my coworker about me and she would readily give answers, even making some things up and telling him I was interested in him and playing hard to get. Yes, she was a bitch and she wanted to make my life hell, but that's a completely different story for another time. I finally told my assistant store manager about it, requesting a transfer off of night shift because this guy was making me very uncomfortable. He told me he would see what he could do. Next schedule that came out that was scheduled for five nights. I confronted him about it and he told me that I was the best third shift worker that I had and that he would have the gentleman banned from the store. Well, of course that never happened. Things began to escalate. The guy would come in and beg for my number. 
he would try to give me money to go out on a date with him. He would sit outside in front of the store for hours and hours. He even stayed all the way through the shift and tried to follow me to my car. Luckily, my stepfather had come up to the store that morning and confronted the guy. Finally, I got sick of the man. I told him I was not interested in him. He needed to stop trying and it was disgusting because he was old enough to be my father. I felt bad afterwards because I don't like to be a rude person and I thought I was going to get fired for speaking to a customer that way. The gentleman stopped coming in for a week and I thought I was in the clear. But I wasn't. One night, about a week and a half since the last time I had seen my stalker, a bunch of police officers, several of whom I was friends with outside of work, came in. I spent a while chatting with them as they drank their coffee, and then I went to perform my nightly cleaning duties. We had a mop closet that we kept all of our cleaning supplies in. It was in the back corner of the store by the restrooms, and there were no cameras right there. So, it was a blind spot in the store. I went into the mop closet to get the mop bucket and a mop when I heard someone behind me. I thought it was one of my police friends and I turned to talk to them to find my stalker standing behind me, blocking the doorway. My heart began to race in my chest. Hey, how's it going? I asked him, going to prep the supplies I needed to mop the store. It's going good, he replied, and at that moment I didn't think anything was wrong. Have you thought about my offer? I sighed, crossing my arms. Ugh, I told you, I'm not interested. Before I could say any more, he shoved me full strength into the wall behind me. There was a bunch of brooms and other hard objects behind me that I crashed into. I don't remember much after what happened after that, but from what my police friends told me, I began to scream at the top of my lungs and that's what sent them running in my direction. One of my friends said as they rounded the corner, I was slamming the palm of my hand into the guy's nose and attacking him. They tackled him, knocked him through the glass we use for deliveries, and two of my police friends had to hold me back because I was trying to attack this guy, screaming that I was going to kill him. They pulled me back into the break room. My managers were all called to the store at three in the morning and I had to fill out a police report. They photographed my back, which already had multiple bruises, and arrested the guy for assaulting me. My friends told me that when they took the guy to the hospital, he had a broken nose because of me fighting back, and they had accidentally dislocated his kneecap when they tackled him. I quit the company shortly after because of this incident. I had told them repeatedly that I felt uncomfortable and was attacked because they refused to do anything about it. So, that's my story of how I was stalked and how it ended. The guy is still in jail, and I am happily employed at a job that actually cares about the safety and well-being of their employees. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true stalker stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klemko, and Haunted. Again, thank you all so much for remaining the pillar of which Back to Ashes stands upon. You already know how much I deeply appreciate each and every one of you, and I will be eternally grateful. To the subscribers and to the first-time listeners, and for those that kind of peeked in to see what the channel is about, thank you so much for your continued support. I will cherish it forever. And of course, without you, I would not have a voice and there would not be a back to ashes. So thank you so much for your continued support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these selections. Until next time, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night.
peace, love, and light to you all.